Welcome to Talking Buffalo, featuring conversations with guests from around the world of sports, media, pop culture, and all things Buffalo, with your host, Patrick Moran. All right, what is going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to another episode of Talking Buffalo, your weekday daily driver for Buffalo Sports Talk and more. Today's show is presented by Golf Dojo. Your space, your time, your game. Bring your game to Golf Dojo, Western New York's best indoor golf experience. Visit mygolfdojo.com. My name is Patrick Moran. Thank you to everybody out there, as always, for watching and listening, following, subscribing. I appreciate y'all very much. This is our Friday show. I am joined right now by my good friend and recurring guest at this point, PK from the Buffalo Sports Collective. And we were going to and still are going to do our Buffalo Bills positional rankings. We took all 11 groups. Well, I took all 11 groups. And I'm counting special teams, by the way, just as one group. So there's 11 groups in total. And I kind of rank them where I think they're at right now from top to bottom. We're going to go through that list. We're going to discuss the pros and cons of each position today. Did this list before uh, Thursday morning news broke. And uh, Matt Milano, we'll, we'll get to him in a second. But it's obviously going to change how I feel about the linebacker position. We're going to talk about Matt Milano as well. But anyway, what's going on, PK? This is what happens when I send you uh, an outline the night before instead of just a couple hours before. Shit changes, man. What's going on? How you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah, I woke up to the uh, the link. I'm like, okay, I got, I got, I'm gonna be prepared for this. And then, you know, I think right around lunchtime is when the news broke. I'm like, oh, that yep. went right out the door. That happened to us this whole off season too, because the NLL was supposed to have their free agent start on August 1st, and like we planned the whole off season. So August 1st would be our last show. We could build the whole off season was built around that being the day. And then they pushed it last minute to the end of the month because they're dealing with some, you know, off season struggles with one of the teams. So they pushed it to the end of the month, and now we got to get all creative. So I'm right there with you. Sports changes in a blink of an eye, and you got to adjust real quick. Let me be frank here before we get into some objective analysis with the situation, the injury, and just like I said, this team positionally, which we're going to focus on today, today, and today being Thursday because that's when we're recording this. Today sucks. This sucks. As a Bills fan, this sucks. All right? To have your star linebacker, one of the best three to five, again, and if you're watching on the video side, PK actually has a Matt Milano jersey literally hanging up in his home office, and not just today that's been hanging up there since I've been having you on the show anyway, but to have one of the very best linebackers in the entire NFL go down with such a stupid injury. I mean, every day we've been focused on the leg and I literally did a show last week saying Matt Milano looks ready. I went to camp last Thursday, the last training camp practice and your boy played every single snap of 11 on 11 and was flying around pretty well. And I'm like, all right, he looks ramped up, almost ready to go. Did not play on Saturday, complete precautionary reasons. And then during practice on Tuesday, he tears his bicep with a tackling dummy on a drill. It's just, it sucks. And then Justin Simmons, who I want to spend a few minutes talking about as well, a safety that I, you know, he's been a very popular name amongst Bills fans and for damn good reason. But I haven't really said much about him. I kind of like quietly was holding on a little bit. I hope that the Bills may get in the mix there. But anyway, he signs with the Atlanta Falcons. Thursday sucks. I do want to say too, uh, PK, I want to make sure at least on a local level, cover one should get some credit 100%. because those guys are the ones, props to them. They're the ones who broke the Matt Milano story uh, early Thursday. Started out with a couple crying emojis and I DM them. I'm like, what the hell is going on, man? What are you guys up to? What are you talking about, Matt Milano? And uh, they didn't answer me back. But anyway, they put out a report saying per multiple sources. And then not long after that, Adam Schefter puts out the big tweet and everybody's in an uproar. I just want to say, I can understand on a national level, people don't even know who cover one is probably on a national level, most of them anyway. And uh, so I would get that. But locally, if you're reporting this and, and you're going to bother to say, you know, who reported it first, and if you don't say cover one, I, I just feel like that's pretty shitty. But uh, uh, yeah, 100%. Any, anyway, what, 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 
stupid question, but this is a stupid day right now. Like, what are your thoughts? It definitely sucks. I mean, there's no really no other way around it. I was looking, I, I was such looking forward to seeing him and Bernard play together because we got a very brief glimpse of it last year. And that was even before Bernard really came into his own. I was getting so excited. Like you said, he finally looked ready to go and locked and loaded for the season. And then a tackling dummy just ruins his entire season. It, 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 it overall sucks. There, there's no way around it. And he's one of those players that you saw the loss of it last year. Yes. The depth behind him wasn't any better, but there's only one Matt Milano and he's, he's one of those invaluable pieces that you really can't replicate. There's not, there's, there's going to be some players that we're going to talk about that can sub in for him. And I'm excited to see at least one of them. And th there's a little tease for you, but I, it, there's, there's no replacing him. It, it definitely sucks. And it's a, it's a terrible day for the Buffalo bills for a defense that already lost so many veteran pieces in the off season. For sure. Um, yeah, he's literally an all pro linebacker. Look, I had some issues. If you watch the show or listen to the show yesterday, you would know I have uh, had some issues with StreamYard, which is the platform that I record this on the video side, transfer it to the audio side. So I don't want to mess around, but I'm really tempted to pull up a tweet to, to put on the screen that I had last week. It was one of the few pictures I actually took at camp. It was I Matt Milano and Bernard walking on the practice field into the facility together and talking. And I made a comment about how I've heard of these guys just spend so much time together talking to each other and forming like kind of this bond. And, and Bernard is just constantly uh, picking his, picking his mind. So yeah, this, <laughs> there's just no getting around it. it. It really, it sucks. This has been an off season, you know, for the first time, I believe it now, we kept hearing Brandon Bean talking about a team in transition. And I get it. Like they didn't. And a lot of people are like, well, what are they going to do? You're going to go make a big move that safety receiver linebacker. No, they're not. They've already made it pretty clear what the, the plan is this off season. They shed a lot of salary between guys that they cut for salary reasons, Trey white, Jordan Poyer. And uh, who's the other one that's up? Uh, Mitch Morse. Those guys Diggs was more about than just money. In fact, they didn't really save any money by trading. So I might could include Stefan Diggs. But those other guys, that's salary-driven moves because they want to be in good cap shape next year, and they got good draft capital next year. They got a first. They got two twos because of the use of trade. They traded digs for draft capital next year. Brandon Bean, I feel like he wants to be more aggressive next offseason. He's certainly not throwing in the towel this season by any means. I don't think this is what, or at least it wasn't a real rebuilding year. Maybe it's still not, but they're not going to mortgage what they did early in the off season to try to replace somebody like trading digs or the, the mess at safety that's going on right now. Or in this case, now Matt Milano, it really is going to be a next guy up uh, mentality. What did you think about Justin Simmons going to Atlanta? And are you a little bit surprised that the bills were never even really linked to him other than maybe fans clamoring for him, but I never saw one, even semi-credible media report that's saying that the Bills are interested in Simmons or, or vice versa? Uh, not super. I, I think Taylor Rapp was their main priority back there, and then the rest of it was just yeah. fill in what we got. A Atlanta's loading up there. That, that defense is completely flipped over. Between that and Matthew Judon, them completing that trade either last night or this morning as well, they're loading up on that defense to – if Kirk Cousins is anywhere what he was in Minnesota, they could be a very sneaky pick over in the N NFC. But yeah, for the Bills, uh, it, it you summed it up pretty perfectly. It's They're retooling, and it almost feels like they're saying, Josh Allen, work some magic, and we'll see what hmm. happens close to trade deadline. Because if they are in contention for the division, which is it seems crazy to even think they you know, the divisions in question now, but if they're in contention to win the division or for one of the top three seeds, I could see him pull out some type of trade at the trade deadline to bring in reinforcements. You kind of saw that it with, uh, it didn't work out, but the Kelvin Benjamin trade where, Hey, they're in it. Let's go make a, a trade here to prove to our team. We believe in you. And we're adding pieces to this. You saw last year with Douglas. So I, yeah. I don't think they're going to be adding anybody of name value, either trade wise or anybody still left in free agency. And you already mentioned Simmons already is gone, but I, I could see him trade deadline. I think that would be the time where you see him make a type of move. If they're truly, you know, 
we're we're five and two, we're six and three or something like that. I could see him working the trade wire and trying to bring somebody in there. My first thought when I heard about the Matt Milano, the severity of the injury was just like most fans, like you gotta be kidding me. Here we go again. This team's curse, yada yada yada. This hurts the defense. There's no getting around it. Okay. Next guy up, sure. Okay. Dorian Williams, maybe very well. We'll talk about him for a little bit in, in just a few here. But you're not, to your point, you're not replacing Matt Milano. You're not getting that production. That was my first thought. My second thought, which admittedly means zero, because this is off-field shit. This has got nothing to do with what happens on the field on Sundays or Monday nights, Thursday nights, whatever. But this has been a national media, a lot of national media outlets who are already down on the Buffalo Bills before this. You know, a lot of people are picking the Jets. Some people are picking the Dolphins to win the AFC East. I would not be the least bit surprised now on the heels of this Matt Milano news and some other issues, which, by the way, are valid, legitimate issues going on with the Buffalo Bills. But it would not surprise me now at this point, by the time we get, what, two weeks from now, it would be like NFL season preview week, you know what I mean, where every national, local outlet is doing their previews. The Bills are probably going to be picked third in the AFC East in a lot of division or in a lot of... uh outlets you kind of get that feeling too whether it's going to be again pointless sure but i ain't gonna lie to you i still don't need it annoys me to see that shit it does yeah. i'm not gonna lie i'm being honest with you yeah it's it's gonna be like that and then all of twitter x whatever you want to call it is gonna blow up as well you know everybody's counting out the bills i i think i said it early in the off season though this this seems like the perfect makeup for the buffalo bills to go on that 2020 run where it's just sure. they're they're underdogs everybody's counting them out this could be the season that josh allen just lights it up and is the favorite to win mvp if they make a, a one or two seed you got to count sean mcdermott as possible coach of the year as well it's it, it could be one of those years where everybody's counting them out i wouldn't be shocked if they're picked for third in the division because a lot of teams were already picked or a lot of people around the national media were already picking them to lose the division already between the jets and miami so if you lose matt milano like this on top of all the the safety issues, on top of the wide receivers where they're bringing in other wide receivers to try to fill in the depth there, there's another talking point. I, I could see them easily, easily being a solid third. If you go on averages for everybody in the national media, I, I would bet by week one, the average is Miami and Jets are one or two and Buffalo's in that solid three position. I wouldn't doubt that at all. One last thing that I want to jump into our positional rankings and, and explanations for each. I put out a, a, a tweet on, uh, on Thursday that this team is starting to remind me a little bit of the late 80s Chicago Bulls when Michael Jordan was still younger before they became historically great. And Doug Collins was the head coach at the time. And I remember this very well. I was a big NBA guy. He pretty much admitted the game plan was essentially, all right, Michael Jordan, go be great. That was, a, that was the Chicago Bulls model. That was their game plan. Kind of feels that way right now with the Buffalo Bills. Like if the Buffalo Bills are going to win the AFC East, if the Buffalo Bills are going to be true, legitimate Super Bowl contenders, and make no mistake about it, they still absolutely can. But if that's going to happen, there's no other way except Josh Allen playing at an MVP level. There's no other way. You know, last year with the Kansas City Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes was just... Um, dare I say, close to pedestrian during the regular season. And then Pat Mahomes became Pat Mahomes when the chips were all on the table in the playoffs. But that team was carried by their defense for a lot of the season. Uh, even some special teams play, superior coaching from Andy Reid, stuff like that. Patrick Mahomes did not like the league on fire last year, and the Chiefs still were one of the best teams. I feel like if the Bills are going to be one of the best teams in this conference, let alone the league, the only way that's happening, also to your point, Sean McDermott has got to have maybe his best year of coaching. No question about that. But at the end of the day, you're not going to get away with a B or B plus Josh Allen. You better get Josh Allen on his A game, having an all pro, like I said, MVP caliber season. It's the only way I see it, PK. Yeah, I, I I can't remember who put it out, but I saw it briefly. It might have just been a reply to somebody's tweet. It's going to be hard to beat the Buffalo Bills if you just put a 50 each week. So, uh, Josh Allen, make magic happen. <laughs> have to, buddy. Have to. All right, let's dive into, like I said, I took 11 positional groupings. Special teams counts as one group. 
I did divide uh, defensive edge and defensive tackle into two different groups. So like I said, it came up with a group of 11. The offensive line is just one whole unit. And we'll actually, I want to start at the top and then we'll kind of work our way down to uh, to the bottom. So obviously this will get progressively worse and less fun as this episode goes on. I know there's a lot of people who, who may pick quarterback as number one on this team because of one guy, but I went off the grid a little bit. Maybe you disagree. And I want to, besides getting your feedback too, I want to throw this out there. I want you to give me, when you're done, from one to 10, your confidence level in this position. And again, your thoughts don't necessarily have to align with mine. These are, this is my list, and I'm getting PK's feedback from these. But number one for me is corner. I think cornerback is the best position right now on this football team. You have Teron Johnson, who is literally an all-pro slot corner. He's one of the best two to three slot corners in the entire NFL. Rasul Douglas is very good, and he's a playmaker. Uh, we saw it last year plenty. Don't re- forget about the playoffs. He was hobbled, playing on one leg against the Chiefs. This guy makes plays. Christian Benford, sticky, solid, not spectacular, but I think a legitimately good CB2. And then you even look at the depth. And Kyrie Elam has had a really solid training camp. He's going into year three. He's a former first-round pick. By all indications, at least to this point as we're recording this, by the way, he got banged up in the scrimmage on Tuesday or Thursday. I don't want to talk about the scrimmage. Screw the scrimmage. But anyway, um, Kyrie Elam has looked good, and I feel more confident now about him coming into the game if Benford or Douglas go down. So I got corner at number one. What do you think? I had him at two. And uh, pretty mm-hmm. obviously I had quarterback at one and I could talk yep. about that when we bring that up. But yeah, Taron Johnson, along with Matt Milano, I think those are two pieces on the defense that you just can't lose. If, if Taron Johnson doesn't play, this defense is way out of whack. And uh-huh. we saw clips of that last year where he went out either. I can't remember. He played all 17, but I think there were a few series where he was on the sidelines and the defense just looked completely different. He's, he's an animal out there. He's one of the sole remaining players in the defensive back room left over from not just the beginning, but you know, white's gone yet. You, you lost Hyde, Poyer. He's the last remaining soldier back there. But you, you go to the more depth. You got Douglas on the outside. You got Benford on the outside. Kyrie Elam's turning into a great three. And then even if you want to throw in Jamarcus Ingram and, and uh, Daquan Hardy as well, this might be one of the deepest rooms they yeah. have in the cornerback. I I just have them at two, sole reason because Josh Allen is on the team. But uh, my confidence in this one is like eight and a half. Uh, they they – I went into the season wondering, okay, if you get anything from Kyrie Elam, it, it's a bonus. And he's looking like a bona fide number three corner who can push Benford and make sure that Benford can't take any easy snaps off. And I think we said on the last show, they can mix match depending on what the game is looking like if they need to go for a home run pick or if they just need to be steady back there with Benford. So I really, really like this defensive back room and uh, the, uh, the cornerback room, I should say, because we split that in half. But I, I think they're going to be having to lean on them even more with the Matt Milano injury. Good point about throwing in Ingram and Hardy. I should have done that. And especially Hardy, because I'll tell you, he didn't really, well, you know what? It's one preseason game and he really caught a, a punt inside the five yard line. And that was really dumb, but he's a rookie six rounder, but he's actually looked good at camp. And you could tell the Bills want him to make this roster because they're giving him a lot of reps on the boundary, not just that inside slot, which, you know, you want him to be more well-rounded because you need your guy in the 53 to be more than just a, a slot guy. Back to Teron, too. Teron, I'll say this. He gets he's he could play that linebacker position, too, in the Bills' base nickel. There are not a lot of other corners in the NFL who are physical enough to be able to even adequately do what he does in terms of their base defense, let alone how good he is in coverage and his penchant for making some game impactful plays. And with, with Benford, I just think he's one of the more, uh, last year he was one of the more underrated corners in this league. When you go to PFF and I kind of take PFF with a grain of salt, but I put some stock into their stats and he was ranked like top 10, top 11 corners in a lot of different key uh, PFF analytical categories. So yeah, that's why I got them number one. We'll go to two because I'm sure we had this flip flop as quarterback. Josh Allen, duh. I mean, do we really need to talk much about Josh Allen? We we know what he is. 
And more importantly, we know what he needs to be right now for the Buffalo Bills to be good. And I'm not a Mitch Trubisky guy, but you know what? He's fine as a number two. Look, if Josh goes down, just like if Mahomes goes down, season over. Burrow goes down, you saw what happened. Very few teams have that quarterback where you could lose a key starter and still be all right. Um, Mitch is fine, maybe by comparison to his peers. I didn't bother to go look at 31 other backup quarterbacks, but I'd be willing to wager he's somewhere 12 to 17, maybe, with QB2s around the league. Third quarterback, whatever. I'm not going to talk about a third quarterback. I don't give a shit because they're only going to keep two on the roster anyway. But yeah, man, Josh Allen is Josh Allen. Mitch Trubisky is adequate. Yeah, I had them one. My confidence in them is 10 based on exactly what you said. It, it, Josh Allen, fully confident in 100%, have no worries whatsoever. If he goes down, your season's over anyway. So who really cares about who your backup is? So that that's why I had them one over the cornerback. But I can see why cornerback is one on your list because of the depth. Because you, know, you, you can go down to the third cornerback. And if you want to relate it to... I know it's a weird way to compare these two, but if you want to relate the the backup cornerback to the backup quarterback, I think the backup cornerback is better than the backup quarterback at their given job. So I think that's why I, I see why you have cornerback number one. I just I, I'm fully 100 percent confident in the starter and Josh Allen. So that's why I have them one over cornerback. But I, I, again, I see why you have those two flip flopped. You know, maybe I'm underselling Mr. Bisky a, a tiny bit, too. Now that I'm thinking about it compared again to other QB twos around the league, this guy has a lot of starting experience. He looked good in Buffalo a couple of years ago. And when you evaluate him in camp, for an example, or even Saturday against Chicago, for the most part, when he's in the game, he's in the game with the twos. He's playing sure. against the twos, but I mean, don't get me wrong. Now there's things I don't like. He holds the ball too damn long. He's really indecisive. There's lots of like, or not like I should say, about Mitch Trubisky. Should have did my homework a little bit better because I'd love to go through a list and say, all right, how many QB2s around the NFL can you say definitively are better than Mitch Trubisky? If you're watching or listening to this show, let us know. How many quarterbacks out there do you think definitively are better than uh, Mitch Trubisky? Your confidence level, you said, is a 10 with the quarterbacks because of Josh Allen, right? 100%. 100%. Yeah, it would yeah. drop down to a two if he gets hurt. <laughs> can you imagine, real quick, side little sidebar here? Look, again, you can say the same thing about a lot of teams, but forget about, you know, if Josh Allen got hurt week one, and this this might be a team that would be struggling to win five or six games with the other 52 guys on their roster. That's how special Josh Allen is. That's how special and important Josh Allen is to this football team right now because... Again, I think there's other great teams. Like if Purdy goes down in Frisco, I think if Mahomes went down in Kansas City, Cincinnati contended last year with Alboro. You know, they have really good rosters. I'm not sure this year. Last couple of years, the Bills roster, I thought was good enough to be stay in that mix even without Josh Allen for a prolonged period of time. Not this year. It's Josh or Bust, man. If, if Josh goes down, you and I are going to be doing some mock drafts around Thanksgiving time because... The bill's going to be bigger somewhere in the top 10 and we'll be, uh, we'll be locked in on that. Uh, all right. One more I want to do, and then we'll get to a break here. Number three, I got tight ends. Um, Dalton Kincaid, I think absolutely has top three to five tight end in the NFL potential. I think we saw some signs of it last year. Um, we know how much more he can be. And, uh, Dawson Knox, I was looking at some actual breaking news. I don't call it breaking news, but as we're recording this, the Bills reached an injury settlement. I knew this was coming with Chase Claypool. According to today's transaction wire, he's now a free agent. So Chase Claypool is now free to sign with another team. He's not on IR, whether that's another team, Buffalo Bills. We'll get to the receivers in a second. But anyway, Dalton Kincaid, top three to five tight end, I think, potential. He has Dawson Knox for his shortcomings. There's not going to be many better backup tight ends in the NFL, if any, than Dawson Knox. I mean, this is a guy who had 49 catches two years ago, 48 catches three seasons ago. He's a good blocker. And you got Quinton Morris. He's a really good special teams guy. And I think he's capable 
of doing some things on offense. He caught a, a, a big touchdown last year in a narrow victory against uh, the New York Giants at home on, on Sunday Night Football. This is a unit that I like a lot, um, and especially I'm projecting with Kincaid, but I think only a little bit. I think it's a safe bet he's going to be better, one of the better tight ends. What do you think? Yeah, we agree here. I have them three. My confidence is eight and a half. It's it. I might be more blinded in this position based on what I'm expecting from Dalton Kincaid this year rather than what I've seen, which is similar to what we talked about with the cornerback position. We've already know what they have there. We've seen from Josh Allen. We already know what they're. I'm more expecting Dalton Kincaid to take that next step, and I think that's why I have them where I do at number three. But yeah, I I can see him finishing the year. We did it earlier in the offseason where I have him in the top five in all tight ends in you know yards yeah. and catches and possibly even targets as well. And then you're talking about Dawson Knox. He you said it perfectly. He's a great backup tight end. And I think he gets a bad rap because of the contract he signed. If the contract doesn't match up, if if, the, if he never signed that big contract when he did, when they were expecting him to take that next step and be that starting tight end here until Dalton Kincaid fell in their lap. I don't think he would be getting the rap he is. He's kind of like Jeff Skinner. Jeff Skinner came with the $9 million <laughs> tag. I'm not blaming him for that. He's a right. good player. He has deficiencies, but he gets a bad rap because of the, the, the tag that's attached to him with the money. So I'm not blaming Dawson Knox for signing the contract. Anybody would have done it. But yeah, this is this is also a very deep room. Mitch Mo- or Quentin Morris, yes, he might not be... a a good solid tight end that you want on the field, but with the losses on special teams, he is a very valuable piece there as well. So they're two deep, possibly three deep if you need to at this position. And I'm expecting Dalton Kincaid to have a big, big year. And with the offense probably having to take more of the slack from the defense, Dawson Knox could be putting up 35 to 45 catches as well. And maybe, you know, five, six touchdowns in the end zone. Probably is at least worth mentioning. Zach Davidson, who had a good camp early on, but he's kind of tapered off. Uh, yeah. Didn't even do anything in the preseason game. That scrimmage that's completed now on Thursday, I've been following a bunch of reporters, actually from Pittsburgh and Buffalo. Didn't really see him involved uh, in anything. Kind of good news, bad news, as we get to a break on that. Good news, from what I've read, anyway, Dalton Kincaid was smoking fools on Pittsburgh's defense during the scrimmage. Bad news is Knox, as I, I think it's a groin injury or something, and and he did not play good practice, too, for uh, for Quinn and Morris. But anyway, quick break. Come back, and we'll continue Buffalo Bills positional rankings. The Buffalo Bills are hobbled, man, after losing Matt Milano, which, by the way, I mean, we're pretty much just had a eulogy for the guy. It's potentially he could be back in December. So, you know, it could be week. 13, 14, 15, and if everything goes right and the Bills are still in the mix and they get a healthy Matt Milano back for the very stretch run and possibly, hopefully, into uh, the, the to, to the postseason as well. So uh, that's at least worth noting. It's not like a torn ACL where your boy's gone for at least a a full year. Uh, good news, bright side, silver lining. His knee should be, his leg should be fine. <laughs> By the time he gets back here in uh, December. Anyway, continuing on, number four, I got the defensive tackle position um, at Oliver Daquan Jones. All right, look, it's no secret that I'm pretty critical of Ed Oliver because of the last couple of years, the postseason collapses that he has had on this team. Daquan Jones has been injury prone, the torn back last year. He's fighting a groin injury this year already. He wasn't able to play against the Bengals two years ago in the playoff loss. Those two guys together, I would out question one of the better NFL defensive tackle tandems. Austin Johnson was kind of a low key pickup from the Chargers that I really like. He impressed me a little bit at camp, and he especially impressed me against Chicago on Saturday. I think he's a and a significant upgrade. Him and Dwayne Carter, by the way, Dwayne Carter, a third round rookie. A big reason, by the way, the Bills wanted that third round pick. I mean, they couldn't project to pick 28 that they were going to end up getting Dwayne Carter at 90 or whatever, but they knew they wanted to get a third round pick. And this was a reason why they wanted to add to the line. Um, so they trade down, they end up with Dwayne Carter. So you got Johnson and Carter as your backups. That to me is much, much, much better than an old injured Jordan Phillips, a guy in Tim Settle who just never really amounted to anything with the Buffalo Bills. Hopefully he does better in Houston. Puna Ford, nothing came of him. Naval Joseph got off the couch. He 
probably should have just stayed on the couch. I've said that a few times now. This is a position where I really, I like the starters and I think the backups are significantly better than what they were last year. For regular season, I agree putting them four. If we're talking playoffs mm-hmm. where Ed Oliver disappears, I'll probably drop them. Okay. But yeah, it, it it's... You're coming back with the same two starters with Oliver and Daquan Jones, but Daquan Jones right. is second year in this system. So mm-hmm. paired him with Oliver, more connection there. Uh, hopefully Jones is fully healthy when the season starts up. And then you got, in my opinion, better depth with Johnson and Carter with, on top of the the four you mentioned that they went out the door with last year. I, I do like this position. I, I think they're probably going to have to lean on Oliver and Jones more. So I think their snap counts are probably going to be towards 65 to 70, even though I know Sean McDermott likes to rotate that line a lot because mm-hmm. relying on Carter, who's a rookie, Yes, he's going to have big time flashes, but he's also going to have some, you know, hiccups along the way, which, you know, all third round picks and later do. But if Oliver and DePon Jones can stay healthy and be more of those anchors on that line and Oliver can get to the quarterback more often with the, uh, Jones staying healthy next to him. I'm I'm very pleased with how this defensive tackle position was sort of rebuilt, retooled this offseason because I do think they're deeper than last year, and I think they have better playmakers than they did last year with Phillips, Settle, and Food Ford because you know Phillips does flash, but he can also make those stupid boneheaded penalties, and then he disappears at times. Settle and Ford completely forgot they were even on the team until I was going through these notes and went, oh yeah, they were there last year. I completely forgot about. It. I was a big Puna Ford fan when they signed him and then he did nothing. I was a big Tim Settle fan when they signed him. The word on the street was he just, he was stuck behind two great tackles in Washington, which he was, and then he just needed opportunity. He had plenty of opportunity in Buffalo and it just never really amounted uh, to anything. All right. So on the original outline that I sent you overnight, when you woke up to it this morning, I had linebackers at five, not anymore. Like I said, they're bumped down the list. Okay. So, My new number five, I got to make sure I got these numbers right because I didn't even change the numbers. So linebackers is going to get bumped down. We'll get to them when I think it's appropriate. Uh, So that means defensive end now moves up one spot for me. Uh, This position, look, Greg Rizzo is like the one, I want to say sure thing on this team uh, at this position. By sure thing, I don't mean great. He's been very good, but he needs to be great. He is a, he actually is a great def- edge defender. Like he's really good at setting the edge. He's good at stopping the run. He does a lot of things well. He's got some juice again into the quarterback. He can make athletic plays. He had that interception. Uh, ret- it was a, well, not a return for a touchdown, but yeah, one against Kansas City. I remember that. Anyway, he makes plays, but he needs to, to get to that next level. He needs to be a guy who plays 17 games and he needs to get, 10 to 13 sacks for this team. Uh, I think he's very capable of doing it. This is a big year for him in a lot of ways, including money. Um, A.J. Epinesa, I I like him. He's been pretty solid and productive. And the thing about A.J. Epinesa is he's put up six and a half sacks, I think, the last two years. And he's never played more than 45% of the snaps. I think that's going to change this year. I think he's going to be around 55 to 60 percent of the snaps for this team. So he's got an opportunity to to have an uptick in his production. I like what I've seen so far from Vaughn Miller at camp. He's moving around a lot quicker. He looks to be a hundred percent anyway, although they're being very protective of him. Um hopefully he's still got something left. His him playing 50 to 60 percent of the snaps that that's done. I think he's going to be a situational it's third and eight and you we know you're throwing the football. Or you're down two scores and there's six minutes left in the game. You're going to see him pin his ears back. I think in that role, like maybe kind of like Leonard Floyd last year, hopefully, you know, best case scenario, that's what you see from Vaughn. Dwan, Dwan Smoot, kind of like Shaq Lawson, a little more juice. Um, He can play inside, outside. He, he's done some nice things at Jacksonville, not last year, but before that, uh, Javon Solomon, a, a project guy, but I like him. He's got a lot of upside. Really, I don't expect too much from him as a rookie this year. Kingsley Jonathan, maybe, did I sell this position short? I think I just might have talked myself into bumping them up a spot or two. But anyway, that's where I got defensive ends. What are your thought, uh, thoughts on, on this group collectively? Yeah, like you said, we're kind of adjusting on the fly here. I, I had mm-hmm. them, uh, we're, we're ranking them five. I had them sixth. Mm-hmm. Um, I might not be as high as you are. 
Um, I, I do agree. Gregory Rousseau needs to take that next step. Like there's no other question around it. He needs to take that next step and I'll build up more confidence. But until I see it, I gotta, I gotta base on what I've seen in previous years. I mean, five sacks is not good enough for him. I know it, even when Von Miller wasn't Von Miller last year, he had that opportunity and he came up short. I I'm, I'm a big AJ Epinesa fan. I think he's going to lead the team in sacks. I've said that multiple times now. I, I, I like him a lot. Von Miller does look good. And I think he's going to not excel, but I think he's the role that they're going to put him in is situational. And I think he can play that w- role very well. And then you're talking about Smoot and Solomon and, you know, two Hill. He's been hurt a lot. I don't think he's going to even make the team, but no. I, I think I'm, I'm more nervous with this position. And I think I would have had more confidence in them had they had Matt Milano back them. And this whole thing, it's not just about the linebackers. It's, it's the trickle down effect that, it, it hurts all the other positions Matt Milano does just because of how reliable he is and how an all pro he is back there. So I, I think th- losing Matt Milano even hurts this position a bit more. Just be, you know, there's nobody behind him. If Gregory Rousseau can take that next step and be that great, you know, freak athlete, the, the, you know, superhuman that he looks like, I will have a lot more confidence in this team, but they just, they don't seem like they have a one a guy yet. And until they do uh, this, this position scares me a bit. If we were doing a a countdown of under the radar guys who are going to play very significant roles on this football team this year, I think AJ Vanessa would be ranked really high. I don't talk about him much. I say that because maybe I've been a little bit optimistic with Vaughn. And I kind of almost him in prove me wrong mode, but I, I think he's washed. I don't believe anything he says. Anything I see, anything I hear from him, I just don't believe it. I'm still I mean, waiting for Bill Beckham to sign here. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly, man. So I'm I'm kind of in you need to show me mode uh when it comes to Vaughn. It's kind of why I got him around where I did. All right. Next up on the list, I got running backs. James Cook. What an enigma. All right. So I just said if we're doing a countdown of under the radar guys who could be really important players. I said AJ would be high. If we were doing a countdown of maybe the biggest enigmas on this football team, James Cook would be damn near the top. He's so talented in a lot of ways, man. He's shifty, sneaky power. Like he can make you miss. He can run through you. He was fourth in the NFL in rushing last year. He was seventh, I believe, in yards from scrimmage. He comes out of the backfield well. I mean, that was his strength coming out of Georgia. That's why the Bills took him in the second round because of his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield primarily. He does those things good, but there are trust issues with James Cook. This dude fumbles. He's done it a couple times in practice, He and especially the drops. The drops are bad. I mean, he dropped three touchdowns at least last year, and he's been very wishy-washy so far this summer as well. So I'm, I'm torn about him right now. I do like Ty Johnson. I think he's a very solid, not spectacular, but a solid RB2. I think when Joe Brady became OC, he immediately brought him up and Ty Johnson showed some production, 30 carries, 132 yards. He averaged 4.4 yards per carry last year with the bills also caught like seven passes. So we could do some things. I also think week one, he's going to be one of those two kick returners. He's going to throw that out there as well. And by the way, he's back practicing Ray Davis, incredibly intrigued by him. He's promising fourth round rookie, Catches the ball really well. I've heard a lot of reports from today, today being Thursday, that he looked, he shined doing some pass catching stuff in a seven on seven stuff with Josh Allen. Um, Got that Latavius Murray kind of role, I think, in coming. He can, he can chip you, he can pass block, and he can come out and get some ball out of the backfield. He runs pretty well in between the tackles. Worst case, I think he could be Latavius Murray. Best case for him, you might get your see a, a platoon situation almost between Davis and Cook. So I'm not quite sure what to make of this position. I would have it higher if James Cook could catch the football. Like if James Cook, if I could trust him to catch the football when it's thrown to him, this might even be a top three positional group. But right now I got it out of middle of the pack because I got trust issues with James Cook. Yeah, I got him one spot lower than you do. And the next mm. position group that we'll be talking about is the reason that the previous two are bumped down one, but I, I got him at six and a half confidence. It, it's, it comes down to exactly what you just finished saying there, James cook and his inability to catch. And it's just, I was saying all off season, if he was able to fix that area of his game, this offense can take 
another step forward in what we're hoping them to be. Because if he's able to roll out of the uh, the backfield and and be reliable, and Josh Allen can trust him, and the offense can trust him, and Sean McDermott can trust him, it, it changes the dynamic of the running game because you're you're not going to be okay. James Cook is in the backfield. It, you're not going to just say okay, this is a run play because you're going to be able to worry about, okay, he can actually catch this. Teams are going to learn that this guy drops it more times than he can catch it. I, I agree with you, Ty Johnson. You kind of stole what I was going to say with, I expect him to be the main kick returner back there as well. So I'm right there with you. But yeah, he, he's, a, he's a solid number two back there. He's got some speed. He's got he's a sneaky good player. And I liked him when he was on the Jets as well. And then he, he, you, you said it perfectly with Ray Davis as well. I could see if if James Cook can't catch the ball, I could see a timeshare back there, even if James, James, even with James Cook's great season last year. I mean, 11 over 1,100 yards rushing. He had a really, really good season once Joe Brady took over the offense and they lean on him more. It's just, I, I can't trust his hands. And that's a very big aspect of it. And, you know, one or two fumbles. Could he be in the doghouse for a while? And you, you get the Ty Johnson, Ray Davis show, and maybe J they, you know, shine and you don't really see the the peak James Cook that you possibly could if you could fully trust him. So that's why I got them at seven and six and a half confidence is just because James Cook's hands. It, it's it's a scary, scary thing, which I was really hoping he would fix this offseason. All right, a real quick break here to let you know, hey, golf fans, and I know there's plenty of you out there watching and listening right now. Want to let you know that whether you're a beginner that's brand new to the sport, trying to truly learn the game, or even if you're a regular fixture on the course, looking to get your game up to that next level by getting lessons. I'm here to tell you right now that the teaching pro you need in your life is definitely Jeff Metis, an award-winning PGA professional. Jeff has been helping golfers of all skill levels get the very most of their ability for nearly three decades. Jeff is also a well-known voice of golf off the course as well as co-host of the TD Green Show on WGR 550 alongside Brian Cozio. Lessons with Jeff Metis will drastically change your game for the better. Trust me, I am seeing it right now firsthand. Visit www.mygolfdojo.com to book your lessons with Jeff Metis today. All right, PK. So I am... This is the point where now I'm like, what do I do with the linebackers? Because again, this should have been a position we talked about a while ago. Am I putting them here? We're doing this in real time, literally. Uh, no, they're not ready yet. They're going to sink even further. I'm going offensive line next, okay? Deion Dawkins at left tackle is borderline great. He's a multiple-time pro bowler right now. Spencer Brown was really, really good in 2023. After a meh, 2022 Brandon Bean, I still remember this like it was yesterday. He sat at that podium and was very high on Spencer Brown when he kind of sucked in 2022 and said the injuries, the back had a lot to do with it. And Brandon Bean was proven right because Spencer Brown stayed healthy last year and he was a big, big asset. Oh, Cyrus Torrance, second round rookie, pretty solid as a rookie, but he's got some bumps to get over, man. There's, I'm not sold on him being a anything more than adequate guard right now. But again, he is young. He should get better. I'm all right with him. Connor McGovern, there are questions about him moving to center. You know, there's no question about it. Well, there is questions because I'm questioning it. But he's a guard. Now he's playing center. He hasn't really played much center in the NFL. I don't love that. Uh, David Edwards, who was a backup last year, for all intents and purposes, has been handed the starting right guard job because they have brought no legitimate real competition in for him during camp. They got rid of Mitch Morris, of course. I still hate that move. I would be very tempted to say if I could have one move from this offseason back, it would be give me Mitch Morris. The Bills offensive line last year, all five of them started 17 games each, and it was by far Josh Allen's best offensive line. And you either got rid of one guy and you reshuffled another position, so you changed around. 40% of it. I don't love that. Uh, no trustworthy depth. Um, Alec Anderson looks like he's going to be the primary center slash guard to start the year. He's done some good things at, at camp. And preseason when he hasn't really done anything in the NFL. Like Al Collins, is he cooked? I I, I don't know. Van de Marks or swing tackle, very likely for now, at least anyway. Um, not in love with that. So the combination of 
switching, getting rid of Morris, moving the government to center, handing Edwards a starting job, and not loving the depth whatsoever on the offensive line kind of has me that this is where I would have them. What do I got them in now? Seven, I think, because I moved them down. But anyway, yeah, this is where I got the offensive line. Yeah, I'm actually a little bit higher on you. I got them five. If the linebackers mm-hmm. were where they were, they were going to be six, so middle of the pack. I, I'm I'm trying not to be influenced by what we saw on Saturday whatsoever because they were it was it was bad all the way around. But I, I really like the two tackles. You said it perfectly. I was one of the ones that was beating the drum saying, you know, Spencer Brown, what the heck are they doing? Like they're not even, and then he came back and we were proven wrong that yeah. the back issue was the back issue. Deion Dawkins, Deion Dawkins. I'm still a big fan of Torrance. I, I thought, I thought he played really well last year. It'll be interesting to see if he can shake off what we saw this, this training camp and the first preseason game so far, but I, I like him at right guard. The biggest concern, and I would probably have them in the top three if they didn't make this move, is if you brought back Mitch Morris and you didn't cut him and you kept McGovern on left guard, I think this would be a top three position for this team. Yes. But but because they moved McGovern, who's a, a, a true guard moving to center now, I had to push them back. And yes, five might be a little bit high, but I think they were originally six before the whole linebacker debacle. I still like them. And what is in their favor is Josh Allen is so mobile and so good, at least still at 28 years old, that he can make up for some of the deficiencies. I'm not saying you should have to, and I'm not trying to give offensive line any credit for some deficiencies they might have, but that is an aspect to this is, you know, their, their blocking might not have to hold up as much because of the quarterback that's there. So that is one thing in their favor, even though it's not, it really shouldn't be. That's just the way I'm thinking, but yeah, I kind of have them in the middle of the pack here. I, I their depth definitely scares me because I don't think they're going to have the same luck that they did last year. And yes, injuries are a little bit of luck here. I don't think you're getting all the same five starting this year. You're going to get some nicks and bruises, but as long as the center, you know, McGovern works out his, his, his abilities and tries to maybe Mitch Morris taught him a little bit of last year. I have no idea, but you know, if if he can work out at that center position, I, I, I do like this, this line. It's just the, the depth depth definitely does scare me. Let me give you my honest Mitch Morris assessment compared to the other subtractions from this season. You can make, it's not even really in an argument because Stefan Diggs was not about the money. They paid him no matter what. So you can't even sit there and say, well, they're going to get rid of some money. No, they didn't get rid of shit. In fact, that cost him a couple more million dollars. That's not even debatable, okay? I think Gabe Davis left because they liked Gabe Davis, but they didn't like him 13 plus million dollars worth. So they let him go get paid. Understandable. I think they still had some, like they liked Jordan Poyer, but not at what his salary was going to be this year. They saved seven and a half million. They probably concluded that Taylor Rapp's, you know, a better player at his rate than what Jordan Poyer was going to be at that rate. Micah Hyde is still sitting on the couch. Who the hell knows? I don't know what's happening when Micah Hyde, um, if he'd be a free agent, so I'm sure they'd work out a small contract. Trey White, was about money, but it was just as much, if not more, about football. You got Russell Douglas, and you got Christian Benford. You can make a case that with the injuries, Trey White wasn't even one of the best two corners on his team right now today, let alone Kyle Reelham. But Mitch Morris is the one dude where it was about money and nothing else, and no one could tell me otherwise. You cannot say anything that will make me conclude that Mitch Morris was a football decision more than a money decision. There was a lot of money to be saved, and they thought you just move McGovern to center, get David Edwards signed on the cheap because he'd be able to be a starter this year, and save some money there. Mitch Morris, to me, straight up finances and nothing else. Yeah, I think if Diggs, the whole Diggs situation didn't happen, I truly believe Mitch Morris is still on this team because it, it they needed saving somewhere, and Mitch Morris was the biggest casualty yeah. to it. So I think if Diggs was still on this team and it didn't cost more money for him to play elsewhere, I still think Mitch Morris is on this team because I saw nothing last year that showed that he lost a step. And in fact, I thought this was one of last year was one of his best seasons at center back there. And you're losing an anchor on that line. Hundred percent agree. It was a hundred percent money related cut cap cap. A cap casualty with Mitch Morris last year. 100%. All right. Damn it. 
It's coming one of these next two. I got to, I'm almost like flip a coin mode right now. Who do I got higher? Wide receiver or linebacker based on Milano being out for essentially, we'll, we'll call it the regular season anyway. Ah, I'm going to go, you know what? I'm going to go wide receiver first. I think wide receiver should be ranked a little bit ahead. Curtis Samuel is the only wide receiver right now with like a, some form of proven track record. We're not projecting here. I'm talking about a proven track record. Curtis Samuel has a, a decent track record. Now, Khalil Shakir feels like he's on the verge of becoming someone really good. Ceiling could be somebody potentially special. I've said it a couple of times. I'll say it again. I feel like Khalil Shakir could be Cole Beasley, but with another gear. He could get open. He could find those seams. He could separate. Sure hands. And the difference between him and Coles, I think he'll also outrun you and get to the sideline quicker, pick up some extra yards. He can make a big play. So I, I like him. Coleman has high upside, but he's just a rookie. And I'm not going to project too much with him because I got questions about Keon Coleman. I had questions about him before the draft. So am I going to not have questions about him now because he's a Buffalo Bill and we've seen a handful of training camp practices and a one drive of a preseason game? No. You know, even today in Pittsburgh on Thursday, uh, Dad Brown was talking about it. And this is kind of Keon Coleman right now in a nutshell. Two, two, um, it was against number ones, two. He had two uh, one-on-ones where he couldn't get off the line. He got jammed up. And that's been his thing, getting jammed up, separation, that's just an issue. But then on the third rep, he beat him and made a really nice highlight over the shoulder catch. That's kind of, I feel like, what Keon Coleman might be for a little bit while he learns his way around the NFL. He's going to have some moments. I think he's going to be a good red zone receiver rather quickly. He's going to do some things well. But you got to give your boy time. Uh, Matt Collins is fine. It's a four, I guess, you know. Wide receiver depth. MVS, wait and see. I was a lot higher on him in May than I am right now in August. I'll tell you that much. Um, Chase Claypool, I just talked about on the show earlier. He just got bought out basically by the Bills. So he can go sign wherever he wants. My gut tells me that he knew he wasn't going to make the Bills and kind of work that out so he can go be a free agent, go somewhere else. But if that's the case, why not just cut him? Maybe he got some money for his time by the IR settlement. Who the hell knows? I'm not going to try to pretend. Anyway, dude ain't on the team. Shavers, yeah. Isabella, yeah. Hamler, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm not very high on this unit, PK. I'm just going to be honest with you, man. Maybe in the future I will be, but right now, if, without Coleman showing me what he is or Shakir proving that he's a legitimate 80 to 90 catch guy, I need to see it. Right now, no. Yeah, we're going to agree the rest of the way. We have the same rankings for the rest of these mm. positions the rest of the way. My confidence is a five. And I think... If you're looking at it as a whole, it's scary. And I think the team feels the same way because they just brought in two other depth guys. And maybe a lot of that is due to the kick return. But I think a lot of it is also due to, you know, the the wide receiver room and the depth they have there. Because I truly don't think they know. I think it'll be MBS and I think it'll be Shavers. But I think they want more competition because I don't think they're happy with their five, six wide receivers. At this point, I wouldn't be fully shocked if they went into the season with five wide receivers just because they feel like sure. they might have better depth elsewhere than they do in the wide receiver room. So Agreed. why would you keep a sixth when you could whoever you're keeping number six might not be as good as like your fifth or sixth linebacker at this point. I, I do agree. Curtis Samuel is a very imp important piece on this offense with how Joe Brady's going to use him. Khalil Shakir. I said the same thing on our show. He he's, he could be a Cole Beasley reliable guy with more juice and more speed and more agility. He's not going to be a guy that catches it. He, he, the biggest thing he needs to do is find that open space and be that reliable guy for Josh Allen to trust. And I, we saw it down the stretch last year. We'll see if it can tr continues this season. Keon Coleman, you said it perfect. He's going to have a lot of up and downs. He's going to make a ton of splash plays. And he could almost be similar. If, if you can get what Chase Claypool did his rookie year, and hopefully it's a better, you know, career than Chase Claypool has had. Sure. But if you can get a, a, a rookie season like Chase Claypool had, I think sure. that's exactly what you're looking for. And then, like you said, Matt Collins, you're, you're looking as the fourth wide receiver there. But this position definitely scares me, and that's why I'm so high on the tight end room, mostly because you need to be really high on that tight end room to have a good – a good offense here. So it, Samuel and Shakir really need to carry the load on here until Coleman hopefully catches up to them. I have a mate. Potentially they could be four as maybe as high as four. Cause there is upside. Agreed. Col yep. Keon Coleman can be really good as a rookie to your point. 
Khalil Shakir, I could see what I want to see. Curtis Samuel might have his best football ahead of him with a real quarterback. I mean, he's played with bums over the last handful of years, and he's going to have a specific role on this football team. And Matt Collins did have 690 yards two years ago with the Raiders. So there's upside. But right now, as things stand, I just can't buy it. And to your point about five, six receivers, I'll give you an example of why they may only keep, say, five receivers, which means you would get depth, more depth somewhere else. Let's go back to the corner position real quick. So you know Johnson, Benford, and, uh, and Douglas, and Elam. Those are your first four. You already know that. There's a situation where Ingram might make the team and Hardy might also make the team as well. They might like Hardy. He could play inside a little, outside a little. Bit. Uh, punt return, kick return. So they might keep that extra corner. They might have six corners and four safeties or five corners, five safeties, something like that. They'll keep an extra DB and say, all right, we only want five wide receivers. If they only keep five receivers. That might be pretty bad news though for MVS because he don't play no special teams. He ain't any good at it anyway. So if he's not playing special teams, he's going to be almost useless if he's not a, a top three. Anyway, all right. Here's where we're going to put linebackers. They were five originally. When I went to bed last night, they were five. Now they're nine. Matt Milano being out is self-explanatory. It sucks, too, because him and Bernard, man, just them two playing together all season long was just so exciting to think about. Uh, so let, let's stick with Bernard for now. We already talked about Matt. He's got pro Bowl ability. I mean, he, he's a playmaker. Um, he does a lot of things. He's like Tremaine Edmonds did a lot of under-the-radar things with the Bills. A lot of tackles. He covered a lot of space in the passing game that you really don't see stats for. Terrell's a flash guy, man. He gets sacks. He gets picks. He gets fumbles, fumble recoveries. A really good player. My question with him is he's on the small side, man. He, he does not look big in person either. Like You'd be like, this guy's a linebacker. He looks more like a safety. He's really good, but he's, you know, durability is something to be concerned about. He's a small stude. Now we need, we need to talk about Dorian Williams because he's going to be the starter. I like Dorian Williams. I liked him last year. Highly athletic, can cover a lot of ground. He's a pretty violent player too, man. He is a very physical player. He's a toolsy dude, man. He's got a lot of tools. But last year, understandably so, so maybe this is the bad use of word, but it's already locked in my mind, so I'm going to say it. He played stupidly. He did a lot of stupid things last year. But again, a rookie linebacker, you're learning your way around the league. He found himself in the doghouse a lot. He completely lost Sean McDermott's trust. And that Chiefs playoff game where the Bills were just helpless to stop Kelsey and that Chiefs offense, it was A.J. Klein out there until Dorian Williams finally got out there. So he's got a show, and he's going to get the opportunity. You know, you know what, P.K., being a starter and being with the ones every day now at practice going into the season should make a big difference. Hopefully, the leadership that's on this team now who the hell knows who it is because it ain't Poyer, it ain't Hyde, it ain't Morris, it ain't Trey. So well, I don't know who the hell it's going to be. But, you know, getting this guy up to speed and uh, he could become a good player. I compared him to Benford. I said this uh, earlier today. I said, uh, I want to be sure I, I don't screw this up. <laughs> Make sure I don't F this up here, PK. I said that Christian Benford is never going to be as good as a uh, prime or healthy Trey White. But Christian Bedford was a solid, solid, solid corner last year and was an asset to the defense, not a liability. I said, best case for Dorian Williams, he ain't never going to be a healthier prime Matt Milano, but best case, he could be what Christian Benford has been to the cornerback position. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, um, I had them actually at four before this whole mm -hmm. debacle, I had them right after tight end. So I was super high on this position. I think we started the show off. I was, I was super excited to see Matt Milano and Bernard to play together. And once again, got that ripped out of our grasp and we'll, we, we won't see it until at least December fingers crossed. Uh, I am agreeing with you. I was a big fan of Dorian Williams dating back. I hated the draft pick. Uh, I hated it. It made no sense when they took him in the third round. I'm going, why the heck are you taking another backup linebacker in the third round when you need wide receivers? It didn't make any sense back then. But then I saw him play in the preseason. I went, okay, this guy, this guy's a super freak athlete. And he reminds me a lot of a more athletic uh, Edmonds. It, that's what it really looked like. And I, he did get in the doghouse, but a lot of the problems is he shouldn't have been on the field most of the times last year. And he was resorted to having to be on the field last year because of the injuries in the linebacker position. So I am, ex I, I'm excited to see him 
and, and it just sucks the reason that we have to see him. But you know, we weren't expecting Bernard at all last year. I think there there are two benefits of what we're seeing in the linebacker position right now is when the injury to Matt Milano happened. It didn't happen week one. It happened in the second week of the preseason. So you have at least three True. weeks, possibly four, to get Dorian Williams up to speed. The second one is Bobby Babich is still in this room, and he was able to coach up Bernard last year, and he's able to turn Matt Milano into the stud that he is. So maybe, and fingers crossed, Bobby Babich can get his hands on Dorian Williams and teach him the ways, because if, if Dorian Williams can read the play, and understand the concepts back there, he can be a solid linebacker for the team. Again, there's no, re don't hear what I'm not saying. There's no replacing Matt Milano whatsoever, but he can be a steady, steady linebacker playing next to Bernard if he can develop like Bernard did last year. And again, that's a big step because Bernard played unbelievable last year. But with with everything going on, I'm trying to you know sugar this up and make it look nicer than it actually is. But I am mildly excited to see Williams try to grasp this you know, linebacker starting position and run with it because if it's not him, is it Spectre? Like I, I, I'm not a big fan of Spectre, so it, it's got to be Williams. Otherwise, you're probably looking outside your organization and in, in a trade market kind of thing. I love your point, and it's a great one about if you got to have Matt Milano go down, it's much better to go down today than it is week four in London or week five in London, whenever the hell that shit was last year, or even week one of the regular season. Those couple weeks, those three and a half weeks or so of Dorian Williams being with the ones could end up making a big difference. You know, I've talked many times on the show with you, other people as well. I say Greg Rizzo to me is a, he's a high floor, slightly lower ceiling kind of guy. Like, you know, he's going to be good. You just don't know that he's ever going to be great. You know, I feel like Dorian Williams is the literal opposite. Little, Dorian Williams to me is like a boomer bust guy. Like he could stink if he doesn't put it together mentally and he doesn't learn his assignments better and learn how to be smarter as a young football player. He might play himself off the field completely. Kind of like Kyrie Elam over the first couple of years. But the ceiling on Dorian Williams is he could be a, star playmaker to your point, like Terrell Bernard became like Kyrie Reelum is showing glimpses of more and more now. You know what I'm saying? So he's a really high upside. You know, we keep hearing, Oh, he's a, he's a low risk, high reward bullshit. Not with Dorian Williams. Dorian Williams is a high risk, very high reward uh, type player. Yeah. Spectre's fine. By the way, he's hurt too. He's got a calf injury. He's going to be out for at least a week. That's the latest. And they got a fifth round rookie, uh, Edifon Olofoscio. I don't even know what the hell he is because he hasn't been at camp. He hasn't been able to practice. Uh, he is back now, though, so I don't know. I, I would assume he's going to be in the mix to be the backup uh, will to um, to Dorian Williams now. I don't know. Anyway, I could go on forever. <laughs> I want to get make sure we get, get out here in a few minutes about Matt Milano because if Dorian Williams looks good enough, we might be having a conversation in January or February, whenever, is Matt Milano's time in Buffalo over? That might be a legitimate conversation we're going to be having four or five months from now, especially if Dorian Williams has any kind of season like Terrell Bernard did uh, last year. Anyway, all right, last two. Uh, second from last, I got special teams. Um, I, I think they stink. Uh, I, I'm fearful. I think Taylor Bass, I, 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 I'm concerned. Not scared, but I'm at least concerned he might be a head case right now. I, I That kick last year, might have screwed his whole career up. I, and I, I mean that. He's looked shaky at camp. He did kick that 49-yard field goal in the preseason, which when's the last time you remember a field goal in a stupid, meaningless preseason game, the opening game, nonetheless? It actually kind of meant more. I was like almost holding my breath like it was a regular season kick with Tyler Bass. Um, he certainly got the potential. I mean, he was really good early on in his career. He got a really nice contract, which kind of locks him in this season, they still don't even have another kicker in camp. So it's not even like he's got competition, but I'm not high on him. I think Sam Martin kind of stinks. Two shank punts on Saturday. He struggled for a lot of last year, although he did win special teams player of the month, I believe, in December last season. But they cut Browning the, his competition early, but I'm still not sold that he's going to be the week one starting partner right now. They might look to the waiver wire or something else. No clue who's going to even emerge as a return guy. 
like we both agree, Ty Johnson will probably be one of the two, but is it going to be Hardy? Is it going to be Hamler? Is it going to be one of the, the Bird or Kane, one of these new receivers they just brought in this week? Who the hell knows? And then they lost a couple of core special team guys, Matekovich, Sherfield, Saran Neal. I mean, Reed Ferguson's fine as a snapper, but besides that, there's not really a lot to like for me anyway on special teams. Yeah, kickers go through these kind of things, like even the best of them. It, they they have ebbs and flows. Maybe this is just one of the, the valleys for Tyler Bass, and it definitely sucks because this is a season where you might, you're going to have a lot of close games. It might come down to a few kicks, and to not have full confidence in your kicker, it could cost the Buffalo Bills some games this year. And I, I think, He's going to be the kicker this year. It, it will cost the Bills $3 million more if he's not their kicker. If he's not on this team, I know it's, yeah. he's, he's going to cost them more. Sam Martin, on the other hand, it's a savings. It, it's almost, I think it's, uh, I'm doing the math here really quick in my head and I'm terrible at math. $1.7 million in cap savings if they release him. So, you know, his job's not safe. The only thing that I'm thinking about is, is for the holder position. It, it, it Does that mean a lot for him? Is that the only reason that they're not bringing in true competition for Sam Martin? Because they, they like him as right. the holder for Tyler Bass. That's the only thing I can think of for the, the, you already mentioned Reed Ferguson. He's a, he's, he's a long snapper. He's, he's been reliable back there the whole time. It's, it's the kick returns and the punt returns as well. I think we both said it. We think it's going to be Ty Johnson back there. What does it look like with this new kickoff return? I've talked to that one to death as well. But yeah, it comes down to Tyler Bass really for the special team series. If he can get out of his own head and just go back to what he was that earned him that contract, we can put all the worries to ease. But until he's in the regular season and he's making those clutch kicks, I think it's always going to be in the back of everybody's head and it's going to be in the forefront of his. We reached the end and I'm second guessing in a little bit here in real time because I could easily put special teams dead last. Maybe I got a little bit of recency bias because I'm just annoyed with this position with Justin Simmons signing with Atlanta here on Thursday. But I got safeties dead last right now, okay? Um, and part of it's injury-related. Like, if Mike Edwards didn't get hurt and he was healthy and Cole Bishop was healthy, I might feel a lot better about this position, but they're not. And indications from what I've heard on Thursday is that Cole Bishop is closer to returning than Mike Edwards, which... I thought it was going to be the opposite when it was hamstring versus the shoulder injury. That's worrisome to me. I don't love Taylor Rapp. I didn't love him last year. He had a couple good games or plays, I should say, and he had a good end of the Miami game last year. But I don't love what I see from him at all. And he's a starter, and he is locked in as a starter. And as of right now, DeMar Hamlin is a starter. And it ain't, I'm not one of those idiots out there. And, you, and if you're thinking this, you're a dumb, stupid idiot. If you're saying, well, he's only on the team because he almost died. Yeah. That's that's idiotic, okay? But anyway, that don't mean I think he's a starter. I don't think he's a starter. I think he's a depth guy. He's played some special teams coming in a pinch. But he has struggled uh, to some extent anyway, and I don't trust him. So I don't like their starters. Who the hell even know? I mean, I guess we could count Cam Lewis, who's a utility knife, but they got Delaney. Who the hell knows when Bishop's coming back? Who the hell knows when Edwards is coming back? I don't even know who the hell Williamson or whoever the hell are the other safeties right now, even on this roster. Maybe it's because uh, we were just spoiled for so many years with, with Poyer and Hyde that I look now and I'm like, Ugh, good God. Last year, let me follow this up with a question for you. If you could have last year's version, not the all pro version, that'd be too easy. The 2023 version of Micah Hyde, who was, eh, and Jordan Poyer, who was, eh, and you could have both of them this year instead of Rapp and Hamlin, who would you rather have right now, even at their stages of their career? I'm kind of guiding you with this, uh, this question because for me, it's the former. It's still Poyer and Hyde. I still think even them today, even – Micah Hyde on his couch is an upgrade over what they have right now. What do you think? Uh, sadly, I agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah if, so. if, if we were in that position, if you're yeah. putting all the restrictions on it, I was going to say, if you can give me you know, a full healthy safety room, I would say, hey, I would rather have this year's because I think the potential for what they have in the room is better than 
it, it has higher ceiling than what they had in the room last year. But because of the injuries and because of what we've been seeing, I think I'd rather have Poyer and Hyde back this year. And you could technically still have Hyde back this year. But yeah, and and Hamlin, I liked Hamlin when he played as uh, that the one year before you know the whole situation happened. And he's you said it perfectly. He's not on the team because of the whole situation. He's on the team because he earned a spot with it. Absolutely. Do I want him starting? No. He's a good backup for the type of player that he is, but he's thrust thrust into this because of the injuries. They signed Kareem Jackson, who's got suspended more times than anybody <laughs> on this hurt. team. That tells you what this room looks like right now. I it's another trickle down effect. I would be feeling better about this room if Matt Milano was healthy again. And that's why it was such a big injury. And that's why we started the show so down on this because it trickles down to every single position on the defense here. It's, it's a scary position when it Jackson might make this team as a backup safety because they don't have anybody else. That's the type of position we're in right now. I, I if if Bishop can come back and show anything, maybe he's thrust into the starting position much quicker than anybody had ever thought. So I I'm scary. I'm scared about this position over all of them. I'm more terrified of this position than I was with Tyler Bass, and it's because of how reliant that. Sean McDermott has been on Poyer and Hyde for all those years. Maybe it's because he was so trustworthy with them and that he has a different idea for what the safety room can be. But as what we've seen the last seven, eight years, this position scares me the most out of all of them. Yeah. I mean, look, maybe if Bishop stayed healthy and he really flashed, you could feel confident that, Hey, he's going to spearhead the next era right. of this position. Maybe we'd feel a little bit better. Wraps a guy who was a bench guy last year, and, and now he's a starter. Uh, Mike Edwards, even if he didn't get hurt, he did not start with Kansas City, and he was coming here to be the starter, just like David Edwards on the offensive line. It really is. Ran to be one line when he said this is a team in transition uh, right now. And I still, still, still think Micah Hyde's going to play for the Bills this year. I especially think he's going to play for the Bills. If, between these injuries and Justin Simmons not even being a, a thought to the, well, I'm sure it was a thought, but like not a consideration, a serious one to the Bills, still feel like you might end up seeing him like a hide sometime uh, in the next, this feels like the time. Like if they're going to do it sometime, maybe in the next week or so, you want him there before week one. I just, by the way, and we're, we're going to sign off before we know any extent, but all, DeMar Hamlin and Taylor Rapp both had their helmets off at practice at some point with the Pittsburgh Steelers joint practice on Thursday. As much as we're down on them right now, just imagine this position if one or both of those guys end up having something happen to them anytime over the next couple of weeks before you get Edwards and Bishop back. That would just be real bad. Ugh. Yeah, can we just sign a petition? No more practices until we Ugh. like you know, there's gonna more. be a there's going to be a coach some year who's going to say we're on. They're going to play nobody but the third stringers in preseason for four quarters every game. And even in practice, we're not going to do much of anything. You still might get the freak ACL tier because that could happen anywhere. Milano's injury was a freak. You can't really prevent that. But I think there's going to come a day where coach is going to be like, I ain't risking starters. The, uh, the risk of getting you hurt is far more than the reward of getting you a little more physically ready to go play, you know, a football game. You guys are in your 20s and 30s. You've been doing this your whole life. You know what you got to do. So ride the bike, stay in shape, lift weights, and, and go play football. Screw practice, have team meetings, but screw physical practice and especially screw preseason games because this shit sucks, man. It's it's the worst feeling when and other teams around the league got key guys who have went down too, but when you have a, an all-pro guy go down at a practice before your second preseason game, a non-contact practice or with another player injury too, Dude, it sucks. It's the worst. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Josh Allen, <sighs> don't play the rest of the preseason, please. Uh, no. You better not be out there on Saturday. Well, that said, probably will. <laughs> we'll find out. But anyway, all right, that's going to do it for this episode. I want to thank PK again from the Buffalo Sports Collective. Make sure you check that show out. I say it all the time. PK and Phil crush it. Bill Sabres and especially uh, Bandit stuff. Follow PK on Twitter at PK underscore BSC. Thanks, buddy. Always a pleasure having you on. Always. Thanks again. All right. I'll be back with a brand new episode on Monday. I'm sure we'll be talking Bills Steelers preseason game, among other things. And Lordy, 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 please, please, please. No talk about any other uh, Buffalo Bills injuries. Enjoy your weekend.